Good evening, everyone. My name is Linda dodson Terhala, the Chair of the Durham Catholic Parent Involvement, and I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to our webinar on a Parent's Guide to Learning in the Classroom on Literacy. Tonight, we have our keynote speaker, David Booth. He is a professor at the University of Toronto, and I would like to welcome him tonight, and thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, good evening. Literacy is a complicated word. So in the past, we would use the word reading or writing. And now we include things like film, technology, all these text forms that we make sense of when we read, when we construct meaning through writing, even art, photographs, all of that's about literacy. So another frame for literacy be making meaning. So with young kids, they come to that very naturally. So today's world is very complicated because that child of two and three sees books in our home, in our school, or in the nursery school, daycare. But they also see all the technology that we're using, the iPads, the smartphones, the computers. So we have this brand new world for children, and they're spotting it at one and two. So this was my world, and it's pretty old now. And you can see, just looking at the visuals of Dick and Jane and baby Sally and um, Spot the dog. Pop the cat doesn't need to be there. And uh, that world is switching so quickly and here it is, the new world, where that young lad with that person assisting is looking at a screen, smiling, making sense, working with, brand new understanding of why suddenly literacy is taking front and center stage. There isn't probably any occupation going in the future that won't involve in some way technology and therefore literacy. So if we look at this big list here, you can see all the things we're reading starting at three and four years of age and then moving into our world. They go to a fast food restaurant, they know which part of the menu they want right away. They know their show on computer, what they want to see, what they want to play. My granddaughter was teaching me Angry Birds a couple of years ago and she had to show me how to do it. And after 20 minutes, I said, is it my turn yet? She said, no, I'm still showing you. So kids are very aware of how this literacy stuff works. We don't want to lose sight that play is still the heart for young children, though. That play is still how they really make sense of the world, of their colleagues, their friends, their students next, sit next to them. Play is still a vital part of life. But now we can also play with words, with stories, with games, and many of them can be print-based. So the minute we use print, we're making sense of how it works. This is my grandkids and my son behind the couch doing a puppet play. I just had to put that in. What's interesting is he, had, he did not know that his kids had never played with a puppet until I brought them along. Puppets allow us to talk, Restory, have fun, sing, and the kids did that for two hours. I just sat in a chair and watched. I want you to realize how important parents and home are to children. You know that already, but for me, the whole understanding of their world starts with their home. And this little picture book won an award in Canada, our corner grocery store. Now, many kids who live in suburbs, who live on farms, don't have a corner store. I always had a corner store to go to. And that was kind of where you went when there was uh, something you wanted, something cheap and easy, and you met people there. So I liked the idea. I was in New York not long ago, and I had this book with me. And up went three hands from the teachers and said, we know that store. We went to that store as kids. So I love the idea of neighborhood. And if you take a bus to school, your neighborhood is still on that bus. So all of these things matter with literacy, because look at the signs on that store those kids are looking at. Look how they're making sense of print. This is my favorite slide because this is the one I use in my own life. Read to me, my mind is tired. That's what my granddaughter said to me. So I did. And this, I won't show many pictures of grandkids because who wants that? Me. But she has so many books. She's surrounded by print. She's now eight years old. And for the last five years, she has been print-centered. So she knows stories cold. They, they come out of her ears. And whether the stories are sung to them, clapped along with them, played with puppets, they're building that narrative awareness of how print works. 
I was at a friend's house for dinner and I always bring a book because I know how to be a good guest. And I had this book in the plastic bag and the young lad who's five, Liam, said, a new book, yay! I want to read it right now. Now Liam can't read print yet. He's been read to a thousand books, but he can't read print yet. So Liam took the book, sat in the corner, and here's the shocking thing for me. Liam read that book perfectly using the pictures. He actually said, where's my hat, said Bear. And Rabbit said, I don't know, I didn't take it. He would turn the page. He almost matched the exact dialogue from the visuals that I would read to him later on. He knew how print works. He just couldn't make sense of the print yet. He knew how to turn the page, where the meaning was hiding. He's amazingly strong at reading. So next time I went, I brought the sequel. With young kids, K-3, to series books are terribly important. Ju Julie B. Jones is just an addictive series that kids in grade one want to read. And what I love about series books is, if you read one, you read 20, your fluency is just booming along because you understand how that series works. Now this is a four-year-old at my friend's house, and it says, Uncle Ken. And this is the first thing she's ever written in her whole life. She wanted to write about her Uncle Ken, and she checked the letters out. She's almost got it there. It won't be long before she can handle that. She understands how print makes speech encoded on page or screen. This is my granddaughter's grade five drawing. She came home from school with her drawing and then my son and his wife went to their open house, the parent-teacher night, and the teacher said, is this Myra's family? And Jay said, well, yes. And the teacher said, oh, um, like to tell me about it? And Jay said, well, it's a pretty traditional family. There's grandma, granddad, and everybody. So the teacher said, oh, I see. So when Jay suddenly realized she was talking about the color of skin, so when Jay went home, he said to Mara, uh, everybody in your picture was brown skin. Is that's lovely. Is that, why'd you do that? She said, I only had a brown crayon. Sometimes kids do things just because they're there. There's no hidden depth. But notice how she's labeled. Notice in this next slide, she's in kindergarten, a graduate. America does great big graduations with gold gowns and running shoes. This is her chart of behavior. She would come home from school and play school. Now that's really unusual for a lot of boys. A lot of girls still like to play school when they get home. So her mom has lots of paper and lots of markers. So this is her behavior chart about how they did well. Were they good or bad? Good, yes. Bad, no. And not only that, notice she spells every kid's name correctly. Names are the first things kids learn. It's a symbol of who we are. Her other chart, she decided to record what they had for lunch. Was it hot or cold? They have the luxury of choosing hot or cold lunch, good heavens. So these are the kids' names again. Did this every day, some kind of chart she'd make with writing on it, words on it, names on it, numbers on it. Now this child was in the hospital very ill. And her grandmother would bring her paint and paper and markers every day so her life would be rich and full in spite of the uh, an antiseptic walls. So this is her first story she wrote at five in hospital bed. Once upon a time there was a landscape. It had hills and green grass and some flowers and a sunset and people and clouds. And people loved it so much. And if you were there when the sun is setting, it is beautiful. I love that word. That's how I spell it now. It's such a great spelling of beautiful. Let children spell words the way they hear words because that's how they're making sense from speech to print. That's her wonderful story. And then she wrote another one, love shines in your eyes, in your eyes. Let's go to the ball and dance in the middle gracefully with a boy and a girl. All the romance of life she's seeing there from her hospital bed. She sees beauty everywhere, in sunsets, in dancing. The place called School for Kids is a very amazing place and I want it to be always there. They leave home for school. 
it's their first separation. Of course they cry in kindergarten, why wouldn't you? And then two days later, they're fine. I said to my granddaughter, who's now seven, was seven last year, I said, how be you come to Toronto and live with Grandpa for a while? She said, Grandpa David, I can't. I love school here. That's part of her life. So I want you to value the days of school, what happens in school, the learning, the social growth, all the things that matter. With computers now, you go to a restaurant, all the three and four year olds are on some kind of iPad or smartphone playing a game. They're literate, they're starting to recognize how words and letters work and numbers, and I'm not afraid of texting anymore. I now text. Notice I thought it was a spelling mistake in the title though. Think of the power of the alphabet. One of the most important things for kids K3 is alphabet knowledge. How it works, how the letters sound, how they read, how they speak. And alphabet books give us that magic at home. We can take an alphabet book and go right through the 26 letters. And I like to make them guess what's X, Y, and Z going to be because they're always tricky. And Emma's for Moose, of course, is a Canadian one, so you have the, the nice uh, national alphabet right there. But they can make their own alphabet book too after a holiday or a summer camp or whenever. Every letter, and when they're hearing letters, they're connecting to language, they're connecting to how language works. You can't beat alphabet books. I'm with a kindergarten class. I'm reading to them this book. I bring the book along because it's something they'll know, but it's got some twists in it. I like when they meet different versions of books. So it, it upsets their cognition. They're not quite sure what it's about and what they should think. So I held this book up with the kindergarten class. I'm going to read you The Three Little Pigs. It's a very different version from what you know already. And the boy put his hand up. Now, kindergartens are like that. They're always putting their hands up when you don't want it. I said, what is it, young man? He said, I know which pig builds the brick house. As you can't know that yet. I haven't read the book to you yet. He said, but I know. Which one do you think builds the brick house? Madam? There you go. Have to make a choice. The one in the suit. The one in the suit. Wow. They're right. <laughs> and that's what the kindergartens all said. And I said, I thought you'd build the one in the blue jeans. Because that's what you take when you build a house. You don't wear a suit. I think the one in the suit's going to be the smart one, said this lad, because he knows to look important. Well, he's got a point. But the fun he had with images, his critical thinking was high and strong. I love the fact that we think primary kids are just there to soak it in. They're there to interpret it, feed it back, and rethink it. They've got very strong minds. This is the first time my granddaughter read to me. If your child's nervous reading to you, lie on the couch, put a cold cloth on your head, and say you've got a migraine, and tell your son or daughter, you need to read to me in a very quiet voice. And they will read, and you won't be able to criti criticize their pronunciation. They'll just read to you like a nice reader would. I love all these tricks for getting kids to join in print, to let print be alive and well. She's reading Roald Dahl's The Chocolate Factory. Is that what it's called, The Chocolate Factory? The Chocolate something. Get it from the library. I love these two kids because both of them told me in an interview, the grade one, that they go to the library every Saturday with their family. This is a very, very new neighborhood for, for new people coming to Canada. And they know, their families know, you have to have experience with print. So off they go, and they told me their stories. This young lad is read to every night by his dad. His dad reads very strong stuff. The Penguin Book of Norse Myths, Gods of the Vikings. And I said, do you like the book, young man? I said, oh yes, it's an exciting book. So I'm really thrilled that parents are making choices I might not make, but the kids are learning. Graphic books are very, very big now. You might want to notice that your children, especially um, as they get older, are into graphic. We used to call comic books 
uh, graphic books, but of course graphic books now are very different. They have extended storylines, lots of good words, lots of plot. And I must say, and I was in grade eight, I had the biggest comic book collection in my school. So I'm not afraid of that, but graphics are powerful. And you see you have the dialogue, the narration, the image, all of it working together. And that's sort of what a picture book is for kids, isn't it? You get the visual with all its strength and power. You get the words that match it. So somehow you're connecting to these multilingual experiences. There are so many cute um, graphic books out now. Mouse Queen of the World is one of my favorites. So you might want to explore that at the library. Most libraries have a section now called graphic books. Don't forget about poems and songs with kids. Rafi made his whole career in the 70s singing to children. Rafi's still going strong, but we forget that kids' tunes add so much power to words. But my rule is, if you're going to teach a kid a song, I want him to have the words in front of him, or on the wall, or on a chart, or somewhere. They used to put all the words in a pamphlet you would buy called Hits of This Week, and you'd have the words right in front of you. They're very important because kids are seeing the fluency of that language as they sing those words. Fluency is a big deal with kids, and songs can teach fluency faster than anything I know. There are so many nonfiction books out there now for kids, and we're now tying all the subject areas into literacy. Because we forgot when we read a science book, it's a literacy event. When we read a book about another country, that's a literacy event. So now we know literacy is all through the curriculum. It's making sense of print and image and graphic all the time. So I'm excited that we're not limiting now literacy to one kind of book, to one kind of image. This grade four class each did a painting in the book and told the story, and the teacher put it together in a big binder, and then actually Scholastic printed it. So kids are making their own books now, and it's wonderful. Um, if grandma and grandpa or uncle or aunt or a friend down the street wants a Christmas present, let me tell you, nothing better than a book your kids put together. I have my sons still. So we're doing these kinds of things with kids. We're going to be critical and creative in our understanding, going to look closely, going to use all kinds of print forms and visual forms online and on page. This, I want you to recognize how much fun games, you've all played I Spy. Now there's a thousand ways to play I Spy. You can I Spy the color, I Spy the pattern, I Spy the sounds like, I Spy uh, the origin. There's so many fun words, to do, fun things to do with it. I love word games, and word games are making a big comeback on screen. You can now find hundreds, if not thousands, of apps on screen with word puzzles and word games on them. This is what I play with my grandkids in a restaurant each time. I have a word. I leave some of the letters out. You've got to guess what the word is. So I come to the restaurant with my kids last, my grandkids last month, and Mara has her word ready. I've got my word ready, Grandpa David. Here it is. And it's that first one, and I couldn't get it. Come on, Mary, you're only eight. I've got to get this word. Can you get it? You got it? it? Grade three. So the fun of this is you have to leave the letters out that give the clues. So what she will give you is one clue at a time. So I think that's inspirational. And then my grandson, who's just turned six, I want to play too. So he used his word bank words from the wall. And the first one I said, is it hive? Nope. Is it have? Yes, that's it. And I want one more, Grandpa David, so he has the second one. And you play along. Is it my? Nope. Is it me? Yep. So word games, looking at letters, looking at how they function, look what they do. It's so much fun now. When you buy all the riddle books, I give them riddle and joke books now, and kids can talk about comprehension. If you don't laugh, you don't comprehend. So there are lots of books at the age of six and seven and eight now for kids that are fun books. And I want kids to realize reading isn't always a difficult instructional time. Sometimes we read because it's just fun to read or scary to read or adventurous to read, or sometimes it's like you. So. I'm going to stop now and do this one maybe later on. But we have an expert sitting right here beside us. So it's your turn. Thank you, David. 
Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Michael Hamill, and I'm a, a, a teaching and learning consultant with the Durham Catholic District School Board. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Booth for, uh, for his insight um, on literacy, uh, focusing on K2, from focusing on kindergarten to grade three. Um, this evening, I just want to take you through um, a couple of things. Um, first of all, I just want to show you here, this is what we call our Student Wellbeing and Achievement Board Improvement Plan. So as a system, as educators, um, we have a focus and, uh, and this basically grounds us in what we think um, we want to move forward with our students. Now if you focus in on the middle, in the center, you'll see that we have um, a triangle there, which is, um, you'll see the student, educator, and curriculum. And we refer to that as the instructional core. And I think traditionally when we looked at education, um, the educator would learn the curriculum, they would then teach it to the student, the student would then give it back to the educator, and, and everyone was happy. Um, but nowadays when we look at education, we look at it differently. And it's actually a student who really put this into perspective. When I showed them this diagram, I said, when you see that, though, that triangle in there, what, what comes to mind? And, and that student used the word bond. So I see a bond between the educator, the student, and, and the curriculum. Um, and, I, and I thought that really sums it up. So if you also look in the inner circle, the blue inner circle, um, we have what is called our evidence-based practices. And tonight I just want to focus you or um, direct your attention towards the, um, the accountable talk piece. Um, in education and literacy especially, um, sometimes when we think of literacy, the first thing, first place maybe is reading, second place is writing, and then third place is maybe oral communication. Um, but we want to see all three of them encompassed and intertwined together, just as David was, uh, was referring to as well. So tonight I'm just going to talk to you a little bit more about that uh, accountable talk piece. So here we have what are called the six C's. Michael Fulham um, created these, and um, when he's thinking about us moving as a system from great to excellent, we need to have these six C's um, in place. Not only just for us as educators, but for our students in order for them to become successful as 21st century learners. And so we think of that Catholic character, and we move into our Catholic virtues with that. Citizenship, communication, critical thinking and problem solving, collaboration, uh, and creativity and imagination. We also extend that or overarch that with our Catholic graduate expectations. And when we think about um, when we think about accountable talk and we also think about our learning environment, which I'll move into towards the third teacher, um, you think about that res the responsible citizen, caring family, uh, collaborative contributor, effective communicator, lifelong learner, discerning believer, and reflective thinker. Those seven uh, Catholic graduate expectations really come screaming out when we, when we go deeper with, uh, with accountable talk. This here actually um, I just received uh, late last week at a, at a PA day session, but I love the image of, especially at the top, just, just that wording of understanding of Trilgen as competent, curious, capable, complex, rich, and potential. Um, and David also tapped in on that. And, and I love the idea of, yes, there's, they're little people, they're small children, but they're also big thinkers, and little people are big thinkers. And so when you, when you think, see the start of, of life, and I think of my three girls, I have a two-year-old, a five-year-old, and a seven-year-old, and um, I've seen two of them, two of them are in the midst of this um, as we're moving, but my two-year-old is really starting off in that childcare piece and knowing that she wants to move towards, towards our system in kindergarten. But then when you move down towards that responsive relationships, learning through exploration, play and inquiry, um, educators as co-learners, the environment as a third teacher, pedagogical documentation, reflective practice and collaborative inquiry. These are all very big pieces, but the one that I want to uh, direct you towards is that environment um, as, a third, as a third teacher. And so when you look at this image, the tradition of a class from the 1970s, this is sort of, I guess, a, your traditional classroom when you look at it. Um, students are isolated, um, probably not allowed to talk. Um, being quiet and getting your work done was um, an element of engagement, um, was the only way you really engaged. Um, hearing a pin drop was a good thing. And so when we think about the 21st century and when we think about our learning environments, we want to make that shift towards that was then, and this is now. And the image that you're seeing here right now, you're probably saying these students look a lot older than someone in kindergarten in grade three. And you're absolutely right, and that was done intentionally. Because what's happening in, in kindergarten and what's happening in the early years is that students are learning through play-based learning. They're learning from one another. They're exploring. They're having dialogue. They're having grand conversations. 
around their learning. And eventually they're going to move into this age group here. And when you see a group of, of individuals like this, um, this didn't just start today in this picture. This is something that would have happened over years, several years. And so that's where we're moving towards with our play-based learning experiences. We want to create 21st century learners who can collaborate and communicate with one another. So as a system, as, as educators, um, we get lots of resources from the ministry. And this is one, um, one of my favorite uh, monographs that they've, per, uh, that they've created within the last, uh, within the last several years. Um, but looking at our, our learning environment as a, as a third teacher. And so before I move in and talk about the accountable talk piece, um, we really want to take a look at what the, uh, what the learning environment is, is, how the learning environment is created and what, how it's supporting that accountable talk. So when we think about the third teacher, um, it's an interesting concept because you need to look at you need to look at the viewpoint of you need to look at this from the viewpoint of of a child. So picture yourself when you were a child and think about um, those three teachers. So that first teacher would have been your traditional teacher, that adult teacher that you went to school with or that you went to school and they and they taught you. But you also had other adult teachers. So maybe your parents, maybe your aunts or uncles. What comes to mind for me is definitely my mom and my dad. Um, also my godfather comes to mind. We actually just had a, a memorial hockey game for my dad. He passed away a few years ago. And there was a lot of adults who were definitely mentors towards me. So when I think of that first teacher, that adult teacher, I think of those mentors that I've had. But then that second teacher, which is also important, that's your peers. And those are other folks that I met this weekend as well, ironically. Um, and so I'm thinking about all those people that I've had interactions with as peers, as friends, and the learning that we've had from, from one another. And then the third teacher, it focuses in on that whole idea of the learning environment. So not just the physical um, environment, but also the social environment. And the physical and the social basically complement um, one another. And so when you look at that Ken Robinson quote, look at your learning space with 21st century eyes. Does it work for what we know about learning today or just for what we know about learning in the past? And so when we're wanting to support literacy, we need to create an environment that enriches that, uh, those experiences. Um, we're also looking at, uh, at environments um, just outside the four walls of a classroom. So um, there's also areas within the, within the school that's outside of the classroom. So you're thinking of things like the learning commons, um, the gymnasium, which are great learning experiences, learning places for literacy. And we're also exploring the learning environment outside, so outside the actual walls of the school. So if you think of those three, those that triangulation of the traditional four-walled classroom, the areas outside the classroom but inside the school, but then also the areas that are that are outside, and how do they support learning? How do they support literacy skills? So as I mentioned before, we want to move towards um, looking at accountable, accountable talk and an environment that supports accountable talk. So these are three, or sorry, four um, ideas that you can follow along with. So thinking about that making connections, so what does this remind me of? The, the questions and wondering, so that whole wondering um, about what you're, maybe what you're reading, what you're viewing, what you're seeing. Um, teachers now, when we think about literacy, don't just look at an actual book. There's many different types of texts that we can, that we can analyze and, and look at via posters, via images. Um, there's so many different types of texts, just like David was, um, was mentioning. And in a 21st century um, world, there's going to be more and new texts be evolving. But having this in place, this type of accountable talk piece, allows us to approach those new and, and exciting texts. So again, making connections, um, questions and wonderings, listening to others. So I see what you're saying. But um, it's such a huge skill to be able to listen to someone um, as opposed to just talking all the time. Um, again, which can be a challenge for, for some people. Um, but then again, the fourth one, so add on to what others are saying. So it's interesting how you maybe had a viewpoint or you were thinking about something, but then listening to what someone else had to say has kind of tweaked that or changed it or redirected it. And so that's again another important element of, uh, of accountable talk. So the next slide I want to show you is actually, it's connecting um, a question or an idea that we would use in a, in a classroom. Um, this is a question that you could probably use in kindergarten all the way up to grade 12. Um, in case you don't know, the 407 is being, uh, is being built in Durham. But what a great question to ask. So how might the 407 impact the, the Durham region? And then when you look over at the making connections, and this reminds me of, um, I grew up in the, the west end of Toronto. And um, 
folks that necessarily live there, which aren't that far away, maybe don't know a whole lot about what's actually happening with that whole Durham Region 407. Um, but we would probably have more of a stronger connection to that just because we may see it. I know I see it every single day driving over it. Um, but then again, the wonderings of, of why do we need it, um, again, whether it's a, a negative impact or a positive impact, these conversations can really, can really drive in many different directions. But what this is doing is it's just lighting a spark. And then that spark can then turn into a fire and then it can go into different directions. And, and this is really what, um, where we move down the road of what student inquiry is. So this is a tool that you can actually use at home with, uh, with your child. And we use it here in, uh, in, in our schools. And I just created that question using the question matrix. If you go online, there are many, many different types of question matrix. But the idea is the, the farther you go down into that lower uh, right-hand box, where I started off with a question about how might, um, that traditionally would make, move you towards, I guess, a, a higher order thinking question, whereas um, as if, if you're just asking what is questions all the time, then you're more into those lower um, level questions. There's a time and a place for both. You don't have to do them all at the same time. But it's just nice to be, to be aware and to be intentional about that. I know some students and some teachers use the term a thick question versus a thin question. Um, and so again, it's just being, being cognizant of when you are talking or having conversations with your child, maybe about a text or about a situation or about a circumstance, um, that you can think about this question matrix and even create questions with your child um, around something that maybe they read, something that they saw, um, something that they're seeing in their local community. Um, cause what this also allows us to do is that it can, some questions can create more questions, which can create more questions. Um, and that's when we get really into that whole idea of, uh, of critical thinking. So when we look at this slide as well, so we speak not only to be understood, but to understand. So language is the exposed edge of thought. Um, so when you go back to that original image of, uh, of maybe that traditional classroom where students maybe didn't have the opportunity to, uh, to have conversations with one another. Um, that really speaks out to me when I'm thinking about, about this. But what also speaks out to me now is um, how can a parent maybe take some of the things that I just talked about and, and bring it at home. And so we live in a fast paced society. I know I have three, I have three daughters. My life is, is, very, is very busy. But there are, such, there are so many different teachable moments um, that we can bring this whole concept of, of, um, of, of accountable talk into our conversations. Sometimes it might be in the car. Maybe it's driving to the hockey arena. Sometimes it's at the dinner table. Sometimes it's, um, it's, it's outside for a walk. So those are different ideas and different ways that you can, that you can engage your, your child in conversations. Um, or again, it could be around text, but it can be around, uh, around different situations that you're seeing. So I love this quote as well. I didn't know what I knew until I talked about it. And so that's whole, that's the, uh, um, again, it's, that's lending to the whole idea of extending understanding. And so, and we're also moving away from just that whole knowledge based piece and moving into more of that thinking and also that application. And so being able to talk to someone else about something allows you to extend your learning and maybe even change your learning or change your thinking. And so this quote as well is something um, that I love and I think it really wraps up the whole concept of, of that literacy piece too. So it's, it's moving away from that whole idea that literacy is just about reading and writing, but reading and writing float on a sea of talk. And so one without the other doesn't really work um, effectively. And so it's, it's important that we intertwine that whole idea of reading and writing um, and float again, that whole idea of uh, reading and writing floating on the sea of talk. Um, and even when, when parents are, are just reading or writing with their children as well, it's important to engage in, in conversation with your child around what they're reading and, uh, and, a, and around what they're writing. And so again, you want those, those three to intertwine. So here's just an example of, uh, of a few powerful questions that you can ask your child. Um, again, it can be in various different types of literacy situations. So it can be in a reading situation, it can be um, maybe in, a, in an outdoor situation. But again, so um, having these in your back pocket about, so what do you think? Why do you think that? And how do you know this? Um, can you tell me more? And what questions do you still, do you still have? And so I just want to, um, I just want to end off um, actually showing you um, an idea um, and maybe I'll use Professor Booth if that's possible. 
yeah. as, a, as an example. Okay. So we have Professor Booth right here, and seems like a normal person, everything's good. But when I put this over his eye, I think something else all of a sudden maybe pops into our, what we would call our schema. And anytime I've done this activity, and especially with kids or with adults, the first thing that pops into our minds is a pirate. And so um, it's interesting how, how students know so much about pirates. I don't know how that, that is, but it, it, it is. But when we think about um, the whole idea of schema, so schema is basically all those experiences, all that prior knowledge that you've, um, that you've gained or earned throughout your, throughout your life. And that actually influences you how you would approach a text. Um, and so we use the, we use, sometimes we use the term an invisible backpack. Everyone has an invisible backpack and they have all these ideas and all these concepts in their visible backpack. And so I, my title on top is building on prior knowledge, but I remember one student who um, I did this activity with um, was taught, changed it to we are actually uh, building our pirate knowledge as opposed to our, uh, as opposed to our prior, uh, prior knowledge. And so a text like this um, called Tough Boris um, allows us to uh, use our scheme and develop an, a deeper understanding of, of what this text is actually talking about. Um, what's interesting is that I also lived in Taiwan and one of the first Halloweens that I was there, I dressed up as a pirate and uh, when I went into my classroom, um, some of the students asked me what was wrong with my eye. Did I have a problem with my eye patch, with my eye? And, um, and they didn't have any idea or didn't have a concept of what, um, of what a pirate was. And again, it was something that was ne not necessarily in their culture. But we have conversations with students like, how, come, how do we know so much about pirates? Um, even my two-year-old dressed up as a, a, as a pirate on Halloween. And, and just all the different, uh, I guess, stereotypes or characteristics that connect to it. But every pirate seems to have a, a parrot. They have a map with an X on it. They have a, a, a golden earring. Um, they're searching for treasure. So all these things kind of fill in. But those are pieces. Those are that's information that that we've learned throughout the throughout the years, or that your child has learned throughout the years, and it allows them to to go deeper with uh, with a text like this. So at this time, um, David and I are here to to field any questions that you may that you may have. Um, and so, perfect. So I'm just going to throw a few questions out that we had from our online audience. Uh, the first question um, was, uh, there's a lot of distractions uh, that our kids face right now. Um, how do you recommend we find time to fit uh, reading and literacy into their their day-to-day -day, uh, life outside of the classroom? Well, you have to remember that in school, they're doing a lot of reading and writing. So I'm not as worried about outside the classroom because they come home after five hours of good solid work. There's other things we can do. But you need to broaden what you think reading and writing are. For example, playing a game is lots of reading. Those cards on every game have lots of information. The manual has lots of information. I think you need to know that the things they collect, the things they keep, the things they want are all print related when you look around the circle. So suddenly expand what you mean by read, expand what you mean by write. Mara's list of, of things from school when she played school were all solid literacy with lots of phonics and spelling going on as she did it. And then I think you simply have to have a quiet time. You have to build it into your lives. It's very hard to do. <laughs> My son when he was in grade five was finishing a book where the girl was accused of murder, this young girl of 11. And he said, Dad, I need you to come up and be with me when I read the last chapter. I'm nervous about what will happen. So I only had five minutes, but that was my five. And I think the, excuse me, the old thing of quality time is still pretty good. Ten minutes, it takes only five minutes to read a picture book. Just five. So is that five before we do dishes, after we do dishes? When? Is it while we do dishes and somebody else does it? I think you have to find that little time. Think of small chunks, not big hours, with children. Thank you very much. Michael, this one might go to you. Um, the, uh, there was some question about how does, for a lot of parents, the concept of play-based learning uh, isn't, uh, co isn't common to us. We, we went through a system where we were taught, to, you know, mm -hmm. you, you write uh, the word out a thousand times and then you learn it. And you, you yeah. read the sentence a thousand times and it becomes part of your, you know, uh, grain your mind. How does play-based learning work and how is it, um, how are you seeing it imp uh, impact children in the classroom these days? 
I'm seeing it impact children in the classroom, but I'm also seeing it impact my children at home um, as well. And it's interesting that you um, that you brought that up because. This is actually this past winter. I uh, I built a, a hockey rink and it was very unsuccessful because of the winter that we had. Um, so when I was dismantling my two by sixes, um, my five year old and my seven year old um, started taking them apart with me. And what they ended up doing is they actually turned this one into an, into uh, a teeter totter. Then they turned it into like an obstacle course. Whereas I think maybe five or ten years ago, I would have said, "Don't touch that. You're going to get hurt." Um, because then it's actually evolved into them now taking it towards our play structure. And I was actually planning on dismantling our play structure and buying a nice new one from Costco. Um, but they've actually created this ramp and they've asked me, to, they're using my old tires from my car and they're, and they're doing all these interesting different things. Um, and so what's happening now is actually I'm going to be building an extension onto this original playground set that I was going to be throwing away. But the, the, the important element about that is that it shows how, again, like the, you should have seen the, the, the conversations that they're having, the problems, that the, the problem solving skills that they were using, the creativity that was that was happening. Those were ideas that they were coming up up, up with that I wouldn't um, have come up with. But I think traditionally I would have interrupted that maybe if that was 10 years ago, and I wouldn't have allowed that to happen because of of safety reasons. Um, now the ramp that they're making probably isn't to code; it needs to be fixed <laughs> properly. But um, again, it's allowing that time, and I think um, what play based learning is really allowing us to do as adults, it's that it's allowing us to step back and observe as opposed to interrupting. And so that's the most important element around, around play-based learning is that it provides students with um, experiential learning, it provides them with their own student voice, and it provides them with their own inquiry. Whereas it's not, education is moving away from that whole idea of, and I'm just going to flip to our board improvement plan, just that whole concept that the educator teaches the curriculum, this to, and that curriculum is taught to the student, and then that student teaches it back to the educator. There's a bond between that educator, student, and curriculum, and play-based learning is a structure that's really, really excelling with that. Wonderful. Um, my next uh, question, uh, I'm not sure if this is going to directly impact um, us here or not, but French immersion uh, students, it's a very popular uh, a track here in Durham Region and our Catholic Board. We have an ex excellent French immersion program. I'm wondering uh, what kind of tools and resources are out there for parents who uh, who are um, uh, pursuing that that track with their children. There are now uh, almost all series now are translated, so all the small level books are in French or English, and now Spanish, and we have lots of books now in Arabic. So I think that that realization that we have to be where the corner store is, where the kid goes, that's where the books are. And we're going to find books that fit those kids. So I think that uh, we have to be aware online. There are French, lots of French things online now. So I think we just haven't been aware for a long time of the need. But as you say, parents are driving that need. And it's wonderful to go into a school and hear the kids chatting and talking, as you said, accountable talk, all in French. No problems, norm. When it's norm, when it's normal, it's healthy. So I like the idea that what we're doing in schools is real writing, real reading, and it happens to be in French. Wonderful. Um, and, uh, you know, the last thing I was going to throw out there, I'm not sure, Andrew, if there's any more questions that have popped up since I... They said thank you, but... Not okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's... Uh, here, I'll throw one up more at you. If there was one thing that you could ask parents to do uh, coming out of tonight's session uh, for their children who are in uh, kindergarten through grade three, um, what would you ask them to do? And, David, I'll start with you on that question. Gee, that's pretty hard because I made so many mistakes, but I think that I would want to have quiet time with my kids. I think I would want to have structured, quiet time somehow. And the old thing before dishwashers, when we did our dishes with our mom or our dad, those were very special conversations. And I think we need to find times now when we can have those non-teachable, non-structured, but really intimate conversations, often in the car, where you're riding in the car in the back seat, you can't see the face, so there's a bit more honesty happening, they're not afraid to talk. Long car rides, after they scream at you, are we there yet, <laughs> can still be really valuable moments for that intimacy. I think I need that bonding you're talking about on my triangle too of parent, child, and life. I think I need that that special moment, I only need five minutes or ten minutes, but I, maybe it's when you're just combing your daughter's hair, that quiet time. And Michael, I wonder if you could offer some insights from the boards, uh, from the, just the on the ground perspective. What, uh, what's something, one thing you'd like parents to take away from 
tonight's session? Um, it's, it's basically very similar to what David was saying, but it's, it's taking that time. And I think when we think of the concept of time, that it's not necessarily half an hour or an hour, but we're talking just a small amount of time, a few minutes here and there. And I know, um, and I know again, I'm a parent. I have a two-year-old, a five-year-old, seven-year-old. I know how busy things can get. But it's just important to just take that time, take that, make that effort of that few minutes to, um, you know, to, to read a book to your child, to, to take the time to sit down with them. Um, but again, a lot of it has to do with, with this questioning piece, is having, having grand conversations with your child around what they're seeing and what they're thinking and what they're doing. Um, and, and trying to extend what's happening into their classroom is extending it into the home. Um, and don't allow your child to say, oh, we did nothing today. Right? Have, uh, allow them time, allow them to create strategies where, where they can talk with you. Perfect. On that note, I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Linda to thank you guys for All right. your time tonight. Good evening again. I just wanted to thank you both for coming out this evening and giving all your expert advice and strategies. So thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the Durham Catholic Parent Involvement Committee, I would like to thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.